I'm going to talk about basically an overview of some of the diversity of this one group of fungi that I've studied, and then also talk, um, I'm going to switch the second two parts of the title and talk about some research that I've done into host jumping in uh, these incredible fungi, and then um, finally finish up with some aspects of mind control. So uh, why am I using this weird term, cordyceps-like? Um, it's you know kind of belabored, um, but it has to do with the fact that, um, as many of you know, the molecular um, revolution has changed the way that we um, talk about and identify the evolutionary relationships of different groups of fungi. So. Um, everything you're looking at on this slide were um, species that were once simply called cordyceps. They would have been in the genus Cordyceps with a capital C and italics. But now um, there are actually only two of these that are left in Cordyceps. Um, and we'll go through some of the diversity of these today. But Cordyceps traditionally were, um, these are uh, in the Ascomycota. And we'll talk about some of their morphological features in a second. They were um, almost exclusively exclusively known as um, insect or spider pathogens, um, with some exceptions here being um, some mycoparasites that we'll talk about today. So these are fungi infecting other fungi. And so this is actually a truffle um, that you're looking at here. Um, and we'll come back to this in a little bit. And these are the cordyceps fruiting out of that um, truffle. There are more than 500. It's incredibly diverse. When people think of cordyceps, I think sometimes they think there's the ant pathogen, right? Um, but actually, it's just this incredibly diverse group of over 500 described species, more being described every year. Again, as I mentioned, they were traditionally classified in this genus cordyceps, but uh, we now recognize dozens of genera as being part of cordyceps. And these include, um, still some are in cordyceps, but Ophiocordyceps, Metarhizium, Bovaria, and Tulipocladium. So we call them cordyceps-like because they were once simply um, called cordyceps. And as I mentioned, most of these are, were defined by their entomopathogenic or insect pathogenic life cycle. So uh, they typically produce these um, either kind of whitish, that we call pallid or light yellow um, fruiting structures, or they can be really brightly colored, as you saw in some of those initial slides. Sometimes they produce um, this stroma that produces a large stipe. And then other times they form just a pad of parathesia on their host. So here we see the spider here. You can see all the legs kind of coming out here. And then these are just a just tons of little parathesia that are fruiting from this um, little spider that I found. I'll go through the life cycle in a second, but basically the idea is that this cordyceps is going to land on this poor little spider and then completely devour the inside of the host before then forming this typically elaborate um, fruiting body. When we talk about a fruiting body, these can either be um, sexual in the case of these parathesia being produced here, or we'll see in a minute some that are forming asexual spores or conidia. So just a little bit about the, the biology. As I mentioned, these are in the ascomycota pr producing these flask-shaped um, parathesia. And inside any, you know, each one of these parathesia, we have these sexual um, fruiting structures called the ascus here, the sac. And then a single, and it'll produce about eight to 16 individual ascospores, but they're really long. And then a lot of most species of these cordyceps, they will actually break up into these tiny little part spores. I don't know if you can see all the septa here, but they're these little cross walls, these delineations. And so when we talk about a new insect being infected by the spores, we're actually talking about them being in infected by these tiny little spores. So instead of one parathesium producing enough to infect maybe eight insects, if it's got eight ascospores, it's actually producing hundreds of these tiny little part spores, and those are actually what's gonna go out and be the infective propagule. So an overview of the life cycle, which is pretty cool. Uh, we'll start here with um, number one. So a spore is gonna land on the insect exoskeleton, whatever that insect host is or spider host. 
And then if it is a suitable host, it will germinate. And it, after germination, it's going to form what we call an apressorium. It's the same kind of terminology that we use in plant pathogens. But basically, this germinated spore is going to build up so much turgor pressure that it can actually uh, penetrate physically in, a, in addition to some enzymatic um, chemical degradation of the exoskeleton. It's actually going to physically and chemically penetrate um, the host exoskeleton. Once it gets inside, it's going to go through these other layers of the cuticle of the insect. And so it goes through these short bursts of kind of like normal, what we think of, you know, the filamentous or hyphal growth. And then once it gets inside the main body compartment of the insect host, it actually switches, um, sort of like um, a lot of pathogens do in human pathogens. Once they get inside um, the human body, movement around the insect body, what we call the hemocyl, is facilitated by a yeast-like growth. So it switches to this yeast-like growth, sometimes also called hyphal bodies, um, inside. And then it's going to replicate and multiply inside the host. It, this is the time when lots of secondary metabolites are going to be produced to suppress the host immune system and potentially to manipulate the host behavior. And um, eventually, once it kind of consumes the entire um, body cavity and all of the hemocell or the, the hemolymph inside, rather, it will switch to this filamentous growth. And it will actually form um, what we call an endosclerotium. Sometimes the endosclerotium becomes a little bit where you can see the hyphae on the outside, but a lot of times you can't. And you're going to see that in a lot of the pictures that I show you today, where the exoskeleton remains intact. So it looks like you're looking at a healthy wasp. But in fact, on the inside, it's just all fungal mass. Then eventually after that, um, you get the formation of a fruiting body. And as I mentioned, these can either be sexual, um, as in the case here where you see the parathesial um, necks poking out of the fruiting structure here, or they can be asexual. And then they release the spores and we start the cycle over again where you infect an, a healthy host. So there's a, a little bit of, of funniness in addition to us finding out that um, cordyceps was a, not a monophyletic group. We also had this weird tradition that many of you probably know about in mycology where it used to be the case that a single species could have more than one name. So each anamorph could have its own name. So anamorph meaning, sorry, is an asexual uh, fruiting structure, could have its own name. And then the sexual morph or the teleomorph could have its own name. So this is a good example. This is a specimen I collected in China. This is actually a, a, a butterfly larva in, buried in here because you, all you can see is kind of the, um, the dirt in this picture. But fruiting from it, we have both the asexual uh, fruiting structures um, which was called Isaria tenuopes. And at the same time, it's also producing its sexual morph, um, which was Cordyceps to Cal Montana. Um, now, we call this species, since all this renaming has happened, this is now Cordyceps tenuopes. Go figure. It doesn't usually happen that way. Usually you would be um, stuck with one name or the other, and we synonymize those. But um, as it turns out, Tenuapes, Isaria Tenuapes is the older name, and Isaria is now gone. <laughs> so it's Cordyceps Tenuapes. So an interesting fact about Cordyceps biology is that most species, most Cordyceps, have a very narrow host range. That means they will only infect insects of a certain type. And usually it's like family this or order coleoptera. Okay, um, and this is um, a good example of one of those. This is purpuriocilium atypicolum, and it exclusively infects trapdoor spiders, which are in this netizy um, family of spiders. And so it doesn't affect other spiders. Um, these are super cool biology, by the way. Look, it looks like someone created this plastic hole, basically, in the soil. But it's not. It's the structure that the, the spider creates. And then this actually is the spider's structure. And then the cordyceps is fruiting out of that spider that it has parasitized and killed. 
So that's a more that's like typical for most cordyceps is they have this kind of narrow host range. In contrast to that, we do have some species that have really broad host range. So um, you know, we know at least 12 orders of insects are infected by different cordyceps and, and in addition to spiders. Bovaria bassiana is a good example of something that we can find it on spiders. We can find it on um, beetles, um, hemipterans, so this is like a stink bug, and then moths and things like that. We find, you can find it in your backyard on bees. This is super common uh, that people will bring in bees and be like, what is this weird white chalky stuff growing on my bees? And it will typically be bovaria. Bassiana. So this is um, a contrast to the more general paradigm that we think of these as being specialist species. Some of them are what we call generalists. And unfortunately, I mean, well, unfortunately, if you're trying to study these or develop them into biocontrol or something, things that grow really well in culture um, on our standard media as these tend to be these more generalist species. That's just a, a generalization, but it tends to be these things that will grow on any insect that you can also grow pretty well in the laboratory. Okay, so why did all these names have to change? Um, I mentioned that now there are dozens of genera, which I'm not going to belabor you with, that describe what were once simply cordyceps. Um, but I want to walk you through kind of just the evolutionary history of why that had to be, why things had to change, unfortunately. So on the, this tree backbone over here um, to your left is a, a phylogenetic tree, and it's color-coded um, in these colors based on what the host association. Almost all of these were their red branches, which you see there are a lot of red branches, hundreds of taxa here. Those are mostly insect pathogens. That's what we're here to talk about. We do have in this group and in this tree, we do have a lot of endophytic species. So these are endophytes of grasses and other taxa, rubber trees, for example. These are uh, fungi that are growing asymptomatically in plants. Um, so those are some of the green branches that you'll see and that we'll talk about. And then we see those mycoparasites. These are fungi and cordyceps-like fungi infecting other fungi. And then we have some ambiguous or unknown taxa. The first thing that I want to point out, so we have three major groups now of cordyceps and three families, basically. And the first of these includes um, still the type and all the species that are still left in cordyceps, including the type, which is cordyceps militaris here. And then it also includes that generalist that I just mentioned, Bovaria bassiana. So you may say, well, I see all these other red stuff. Why couldn't everything stay in cordyceps? It turns out that this cordycipitaceae and these cordyceps in this, in this area of the tree, they're actually most closely related not to other cordyceps, but to something many of you have probably collected before, popular edibles and annoyances to people who grow, like to grow and cultivate mushrooms, things in the hypocreaceae. So this is hypomyces. This is trichoderma. I don't know if we have any mushroom growers who have been annoyed by trichoderma, but these are all mycoparasites. They love to grow on other fungi and annoy those of us who try to keep pure cultures of, um, of fungi in the lab. So that's what the real, the type of cordyceps is all related to um, hypomyces and things like Bovaria. The other two groups include, here we go, the Clavicipitaceae, which um, gets its name from some of these grass endophytes that I was talking about, and also plant pathogens like this Claviceps here, Claviceps purpurea. But it also has a lot of insect pathogens in this clade, as you can see by some of this red branches over here. And most of these now, most of these insect pathogens are in the genus Metarhizium. And so this is a cicada in here, again, buried in some of the, you know, it's down in the roots. Uh, it's still a cicada nymph, so it's attached to the roots of the trees here. And then you see this cordyceps, or now Metarhizium ovariens, growing out of it. And then finally, the last group and the largest group, as it turns out, of cordyceps like fungi are in the, the final family, the Ophiocordycipitaceae. And this includes the most famous and um, most expensive um, of all the cordyceps, the Ophiocordyceps sinensis that I'll, I'll talk more about in a minute. And it also includes um, another major group of mycoparasites that I'll come back to in a minute. So this is kind of the, this is the state of, of why things, the names all had to change. Um, because there are these different clades of the cordyceps. As I mentioned, some people are uh, have been using cordyceps-like fungi in biocontrol. 
Um, this has been um, going on for decades now. Um, so this is one of the first projects that, um, or products that people used in Africa to control locusts called green muscle because um, metarizium, um, the um, genus that um, was used for this, it produces these um, green-like um, canidia or spores. And so two of the most common species that you see used in these biocontrol products are generalists in both metarizium and bovaria. So this is um, just an example of you find metarizium growing on almost any type of insect um, out in nature. This is a little unfortunate because you think about something that you want to be a good biocontrol product for a specific pest. You want it to be one of those narrow specialists that's just going to attack your target taxon, not go out and kill whatever insect it is that's in the environment, which both of the commonly used metarizium and bovaria can do. So just something to think about. So I wanted to go through some of these major, um, just some of the diversity of things and a lot of stuff that I found in the field. And again, these, these pathogens of different types of insects, they're found all throughout that phylogenetic tree. So it's not like there's only spider pathogens and Ophiocord or, or the spider pathogens are only in Ophiocordyceps and only butterfly pathogens in Cordyceps. It's not like that. It's really distributed throughout. It's kind of crazy. So um, spider pathogens, um, they include things like um, these Jabellula. This is the asexual form and the sexual form. If you ever want to find these, so you'll notice these green backgrounds on some of these, there's green substrate that they're all attached to. That's because they're on the undersides of leaves. So if you want to find a lot of the spider or ant pathogens, you need to go out into the woods and do like this. And you're just walking through the woods. You look really crazy. But that is the way that you find these, and that's the way that we found these. Actually, my sister found this one, so you can bring your family along. Uh, <laughs> mushrooming. We mentioned this trapdoor spider pathogen. This is what it looks like um, when you find it in the duff layer, just poking up. You know, these guys are not very big. I mean, this spider is probably only, you know, half a centimeter or maybe three quarters of a centimeter in length. So these are really tiny. Um, and, and likewise, um, a lot of these um, things you find sticking up are going to be, you know, in that sub, you know, three centimeters or so. Acanthomyces is another um, common genus of spider pathogens. And this is an asexual, or this is a sexual morph. There's parathesia on this uh, museum specimen here. And then this is the, the asexual um, can canidiomata. These are some of the common beetle pathogens. Uh, this is probably one of the most commonly collected uh, cordyceps in East, Eastern North America, Ophiocordyceps melolanthi. So most of these are, are highly specific to the group of uh, Coleoptera beetles that they infect. Ravenellii, another North American species, this Gracilioides and Formosana, um, as you can maybe tell by the species epitaph or um, Asian um, taxa. And then here's another. Bovaria bassiana. So what you'll notice is that these beetle pathogens, the, the immatures, so this is a larva, larva, uh, larva, and then maybe these are larvae or pp. They're all buried in either soil or wood. And then they form these, you know, nice um, stipitate fruiting structures. Whereas this adult pathogen, this adult beetle here, is not forming some large fruiting structure. It's just forming the spores um, and cracks in the exoskeleton. There are a few grasshopper pathogens, and these are um, sexually reproducing. Both of these were collected by my colleague in Colombia, Tatiana San Juan. And um, uh, you can see one is um, in, still in cordyceps, Locustifola, and then Amazonica is um, in Ophiocordyceps. There are a few um, wasp pathogens, the only ones that um, I've collected and that we have good pictures of are things um, either called sphacocephala or sphacocephala-like. This is a, a Japanese or Asian hornet. These are gigantic. They are easily, um, th this specimen was between an inch and a half and an inch and three quarters. And so you can imagine that this fruiting structure, which is coming directly out of the neck, and so this is probably at least five or six inches in, in height, the, um, the cordyceps fruiting body. And the parathesia are produced on this kind of longish um, area at the tip here.
by far the most diverse group, and it probably has to do with the diversity of, of uh, Lepidopteran larvae out there, <laughs> um, is the moth butterfly pathogens. Several of these in the um, metarhizium now, um, but also in cordyceps and ophiocordyceps. And these are some of the most common things that you'll find. Um, all of these are from Asia. And this includes um, like the hepialid or ghost moth pathogens that are exclusively found in the Tibetan plateau. And as I mentioned, it's probably the most expensive fungus in the world by dry weight. Um, and uh, you know, there is some studies to show, you know, to, to suggest that maybe this is being over harvested in the Tibetan plateau. But if you go to China and you'll see at some of these traditional Chinese shops, they have kind of just like you know, tens of or dozens of these fruiting bodies with the caterpillar still left attached and um, and bundled up for sale. And it's very, very expensive. And it's and it's it's because it's so valued in traditional Chinese me medicine, both as kind of a cure-all for different types of diseases, but also as like a potency of uh, virility medicine as well. And so this is a uh, Nice illustration here done by Daniel Winkler. There are also pathogens of scale insects. So this is something if you're, again, if you're turning over a leaf in the tropics or over in Appalachia and you happen to see little yellow dots, you might go, huh, that's some weird, this plant has some weird pathogen. But in fact, these are actually um, tiny little scales that live, they're scale insects, they um, live on the undersides of these leaves, and then they get, boom, hit by these cordyceps, and these are actually little parathesia where I've zoomed in. So this was collected in the field. You can see that the cross vein is still green. And then I've gone back, taken that same um, leaf back to the lab, and now the, the, the vein has changed color, so that's all that um, is going on there. But these are the parathesia growing on those tiny little scale insects. Lots of diversity in ant insects. These include things like the really famous zombie insects of um, Ophiocordyceps unilateralis here, um, but also things like this um, Ophiocordyceps loidii, which produces these two, always in pairs. You see this in some cordyceps species. They'll always produce stroma in pairs. There's two pads of parathesia kind of coming out of the side of this ant. This is a Central American species, Australis here. Um, beautiful um, str uh, stromal tip here. And, um, and then a lot of undescribed diversity in, in some of the ant of pathogens, including this one, that, this specimen that I found in China. So a lot of times we have trouble describing new species in cordyceps because we find something rare. There's a tiny, tiny bit of tissue. You can imagine if I tried to extract DNA from this, I might have to use half of it to extract the DNA. That might still not be enough to get genetic information. And then the other half, I'm trying to get morphological data. And then at the end of that, I'm left with nothing for the herbarium. Okay, that's a big problem for doing alpha taxonomy for this group, and it's something that is super frustrating because people will send us a single specimen, and it's like, that's not enough. Like, it's good. Like, we know of more diversity, but it's not enough to actually go through that full process. You need to collect something several times um, to have enough material to do all the work that we have to do. Okay, and just kind of like, there are pathogens of other things. I just went through the major ones, um, including, um, as you've already seen, a few examples of things on cicadas, um, both um, on the adults. This um, cicada in China, it got hit by some metarhizium, and then um, also of those nymphs. Other hemipteran bugs, so true bugs, um, include this like stink horns. This is one of the most common uh, cordyceps that you'll collect if you go to Asia and collect Ophiocordyceps nutans. There are fly pathogens. We haven't talked about those. This is Dipterygina. Again, this is one of those species that always produces the, the fruiting structures in pairs. Super cool. Um, and you can see it's the underside of a leaf, too. So my colleague, Ryan, when he collected this, you know, flipped over a leaf, and there it was. And then we also have cockroach pathogens, phasmid pathogens. Um, I didn't have any that I thought were like pretty enough, but um, so these are like you know uh, stick bugs and things like that. Um, there's a lot of um, diversity in hosts, and therefore the diversity of the cordyceps that we see. I just want to mention that there are cordyceps that are pathogens 
of other cordyceps. And this is, it hasn't happened once in their evolutionary history. There are several clades of cordyceps mycoparasites. So this is Ophiocordyceps nutans, as I mentioned, super common. If you go to Asia and you're looking for cordyceps, that'll probably be one of the first things you find. And then here is um, its parasite that is in the Ophiocordycepitaceae as well. So they're in the same family. And this is called polycephalomyces. So here's an uninfected head. And then this is the stroma, another stroma. So just like this one, it's got two coming out of the same host. But this one has been hit by this other cordyceps, polycephalomyces, and is now producing its asexual fruiting structures off of it. And like I said, this, is not un this has happened multiple times in, uh, throughout that evolutionary history of cordyceps. One of them, the species epithet is fratricida. It's the brother killer, and it hits claviceps. So um, these are super cool biology there. So this is what it looks like when you're out in the field collecting cordyceps. It's a lot of bending over. Your back at the end of the day hurts after you do cordyceps collecting. But it is fun. Look at the happy faces, uh, people. Uh, <laughs> I mean, greedy maybe faces. Yeah, we're really excited there. You know, just to give you an idea and zoom in on, so this is my colleague Ryan here in this photo. And what he's holding, now I'm going to zoom in on that. This is what he's holding, this tiny little thing. This is cordyceps, okay? So this is one of the tulipocladium that I'll talk about in a minute. This is a, a, a beetle larva, and then out of that we have these two tiny little things, which is what you spot on the, the wood, this old decaying wood, is the tiny little fruiting structures popping out there, so pretty small. So what do you need to do if you guys want to go out? And there are reports, thanks to Gary Linkoff, reports of um, ant pathogens, at least in the Telluride area, from the Telluride Mushroom Festival. Um, the first thing is perseverance, because it's not like mushroom hunting. You're not guaranteed to find anything. So there are a lot of days you go out and don't find any cordyceps, and that's super frustrating, but it's part of life. Um, you know, it's, it's that training your eye and getting that search image, not for something big and fleshy, but for that tiny little aberration, something white in, in an otherwise brown background, something red, something sticking out. Um, uh, so just a different type of search image. It's really good to have a spade or shovel. A lot of times people bring us specimens and they're like, look, I found a cordyceps. And you're like, where's the host? because they left it in the ground or in the wood or something. And a lot of times when they're buried in wood, that's the worst, because you're going to have to peel away and chip away a lot. You know, you might need a knife to hack into the wood to get to the host. So that's a problem even for us. Sometimes we botch things up and, and you know, decapitate the host or something. It's already dead. It's okay. Hand lens is good. Collection box, something to separate your specimens. A tackle box can work, but a lot of times they're too small, so kind of these you know, lunchbox type things are better. A knife, optional, and then of course your field notebook. But I encourage you all, if you are out in the field, you flip over leaves, especially again, if you're over in Appalachia, you're um, more likely to find some, so. So um, I'm gonna switch to talking a little bit about some of the research that I've done over the years uh, looking into co host jumping, which I consider to be like, you know, the fungal superpower extraordinaire. Um, we could all, you know, probably all I think fungi have different superpowers, but I think their superpower is switching hosts. And I really want to know how it is that they're able to do this. So we can think about fungi as having all of these different ecological ni niches. Um, but m a lot of my research has focused on trying to understand how it is that fungi are able to go from being something like an insect pathogen to being a mycoparasite. Or um, in other systems, I've studied how something goes from being a sap robe on dead plant material to being ectomycorrhizal. So I'm going to talk to you about that work that I've done in cordyceps. So, and in particular, I've uh, used the genus Tulipocladium, one of these cordyceps-like um, genera, to um, study host jumping. And um, there are a lot of different hosts in the genus Tulipocladium. There's nematode pathogens, rotifer pathogens, um, a couple of, you know, different insect pathogens that I'll talk about. But the majority of described species are these truffle parasites. So what we're looking at here is an Elaphomyces truffle. This one's uninfected. And then these ones have this cordyceps growing out of them. 
And so uh, for a lot of my research, I worked, uh, I've worked on two of these species of Elaphomyces parasites, and these are two that are commonly collected in North America, Tulipocladium capitatum and Tulipocladium ophioglossoides. And I'll come back to some of the infection in a second. Um, but as I mentioned, there are insect pathogenic Tulipocladium species, um, including the cicada pathogen. So here's a cicada nymph. It would have been buried underground, the, the, you know, attached to the roots of the tree host of the cicada. And then here's the cordyceps fruiting body coming out of it. And then here's the, a beetle pathogen, Tulipocladium inflatum. Um, so here again is that entombed beetle larva that was buried in wood and then these um, sexual fruiting structures um, up at the top here. People often say, oh no, you work on truffle parasites, like save the truffles, we need to eat them. This is not, um, this is not tuber. Uh, these are not generally considered edible um, by humans, although um, uh, they are eaten regularly by small mammals. And it is called the deer truffle, um, Elaphomyces, so maybe deer are out, them, out there eating them as well. When they're infected by cordyceps, so normally the reason we would eat them is because their spore mass is is really hydrophobic and you would bite into this and it would almost be like you would spit out this really hydrophobic gross spores. You can't even make a normal slide of Elaphomyces um, spores in water because they're so hydrophobic they'll just go away from the water droplet and you'll never be able to see them. Um, so you have to use oil. But when they get infected with uh, Tulipocladium, um, they tend to have, you can see that actually the mycelium of the parasite hollowing out, eating away at some of the interior contents of this spore before they end up you know, forming their fruiting body. So they actually are consuming um, the truffle. One of the themes of studying these Elaphomyces parasites over the years in this study, um, this original hypothesis goes back to the turn of the century, so around the year 2000, um, was that a shared habitat actually led to this host jump from insect pathogens, and in particular the cicada pathogen, to Elaphomyces um, parasitism. So this cicada is sitting there attached to the roots of the trees, and it gets parasitized by this cordyceps. The truffle is sitting there attached to the roots maybe of the same tree, and therefore there, it, it enables this host jump from uh, cicada pathogenesis to Elaphomyces parasitism. But um, initial genetic studies kind of, uh, su or did suggest, so this is back in 2008, um, that there had actually been a, 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 a jump to or to Elaphomyces parasitism, and then reversions to insect pathogenesis. So that's what we're looking at here. So on your blue branches are all your truffle parasites. And then at some point we have reversion. So the ancestor would have been an insect pathogen because all of these cordyceps like fungi are insect pathogens. But we see these reversions to insect pathogenesis wherever you see a red branch. So this led to a new hypothesis. Basically, there wasn't this single jump to Elaphomyces parasitism, but that you had a jump and then reversions to insect pathogenesis. And so for my sampling, for, for, the, for the research that I'm gonna tell you about, I sampled two of the truffle parasites and then two of the insect pathogens. And I had a few hypotheses. Um, so first was that maybe gene content differences enabled this host jump. Maybe that's how they did it. They had different genes so they could become truffle parasites. Okay, so another hypothesis alternative to that is they don't have really have different genes, but they're using their genes in a different way, meaning that at different times or upon encountering a different host, they're using a different subset of their genes. And then finally, um, my, the hypothesis going into the study was that there were reversions to insect pathogenesis. Again, this was early few gene data sets had suggested that this was the case and the evolutionary history of this group.
basically, when I looked and sequenced the genomes of these four um, taxa, I basically found that if we looked at just the gene content and what was shared between all taxa, most genes are shared between all four taxa, and very few genes are specific to just the truffle parasites or just the insect pathogens. So, you know, less than 200 here and about 350 for the insect pathogens. And when we look at those, they don't appear to be related to... Uh, host specificity or host degradation. So it didn't really appear that gene content differences were driving this. And we backed this up by looking at, and again, uh, I'll just try to briefly exp explain this here, but basically we looked at genes involved in carbohydrate metabolism. So you could think about this is really important from a metabolic point of view. What kind of carbohydrates can you break down? When we look at the insect pathogens versus the mycoparasites, they can break down the same types of carbon. They don't look very different from one another. They don't have different profiles. So no clear differences, again, in gene content, and this is metabolic gene content, between the insect pathogens and the mycoparasites. And now, an area that we did find differences in gene content um, across all four of these taxa actually were in secondary metabolite genes. So these are compounds that are not necessary for primary functioning, so for breaking down carbohydrates. These are going to be things that you guys might call drugs or um, natural products is another um, term for these, but they typically have some function in um, eco the ecological niche of these fungi. And in fact, we see huge differences in these four taxa. And so these are, at the top row, are the number of uh, secondary metabolite genes that are unique to each species, so they're only found in that particular species. This is the total number per species, 55 different secondary metabolite genes. These are just core genes. So you, they could actually are in all likelihood able to produce in, a, in excess of 60 different secondary metabolites just in one isolate, so one strain of one species. And all of these are producing, um, you know, 34 or more per species. If we look at how, what the, are shared between all four of these, only eight. Okay, so there's a really different secondary metabolite profiles. If we count up all the unique ones across the, you know, sampling that we have within the genus, these four taxa, they're producing more than 70 secondary metabolites. And I've just looked at one strain of only four species. So huge secondary metabolic potential in these uh, fungi. I didn't find a lot of gene content differences, so the next step was to try to look at expression differences. And one of the ways that we did this is I took this um, truffle parasite, and I wanted to say, okay, what does it look like when it's growing on truffle tissue? And what does it look like when it's growing on its ancestral host tissue, the insect tissue? So I got some beetle cuticle, and I ground it up and put it in media. Got some truffle tissue, ground it up, put it in media. Yes, this is common in insect pathogen world to do wacky things like this for experimentation. And then I also had a rich medium, so something that the, the fungus is just happy to get lots of free um, carbon. And, and I did a you know paired sampling design, yada, yada. I had two different treatments for my truffle. I wanted to see what kinds of genes were upregulated when it encounters its host. So I just used what we call the peridium, or the outer part of the, of the truffle. And then I also used spore mass, so I had the tissue inside. So the take home from this study, we went, looked at what types of genes were differentially expressed, as we call it, between the two systems. So meaning they were expressed or over or under expressed on one type of medium versus another. And the biggest difference that we see is between the truffle and the insect, whether that's the gleba or the peridium. So that's why there are two comparisons there. And it, it's over half of the genome, or over a third of the genome, and then close to a half of the genome, in the case of the, the gleba, this differentially expressed between uh, the truffle and the insect. So some, some really different things are happening when this fungus encounters the current host versus the ancestral host. Not so different, the, the peridium and gleba, and you can see all the other comparisons there.
So what kinds of genes were differentially expressed? Um, as many of you know, there is chitin in the fungal cell wall, but there's also chitin in the um, exoskeleton of insects, although it's differently arranged. Um, but it turns out that on the truffle, chitinases are one of the most highly expressed thing that we see. So it does appear to be important in invasion and degradation of the truffle host. Adhesion proteins, um, are, are, which are involved in attachment to the host, those are also uh, upregulated on our truffle parasite. And then enzymes involved in different types of redox reactions, which are kind of involved in degradation of the host tissue, are also upregulated. So as far as answering the last question, have there been reversions to insect pathogenesis? When we take our whole genome data set and we redo that phylogenetic analysis, what we find is that the ancestral state of the genus was insect pathogenesis. We see our two red branches coming out here, our two insect pathogens, and then a single transition to Elaphomyces parasitism. So there's some conflict there between our few gene, gene data sets which my colleague generated back in 2008 and this whole genome data set. And so when we analyzed all this genetic data, basically it turns out that there had been some ancient hybridization, it looks like, within the genus that leads to some genes giving this wonky phylogenetic signal. So this was a case where having a few genes wasn't enough to discern the evolutionary history of this group, which is maybe um, a little bit of a pain <laughs> for those of us that do these kind of things. Okay, so these were kind of the conclusions of this. So we see very few um, differences in gene content and um, the exception being secondary metabolite content. Um, but that we, it does appear that this, this data suggested that differential expression of the same gene repertoire may have preceded whole gene cha content changes um, within the genome, enabling host jumping. And it's something that my lab is still um, trying to use different experiments to get, get at now. Um, and then we find that the mycoparasites are derived within tulipocladium. There haven't been any crazy, non-parsimonious um, reversions back to insect pathogenesis. Once you become a truffle parasite, you are a truffle parasite. Okay, we'll finish up with some fun thoughts on mind control. So when people talk about mind control and cordyceps, um, they're mainly talking about this cool phenomenon called summit disease. And summit disease is not something that is exclusive to cordyceps, and it's not something that's exclusive to fungi. It turns out that even some parasites, like worms, can cause summit disease in, um, in invertebrates as well. And basically this phenomenon is where you want to get your fruiting structure, and therefore your host before it dies to get itself up in an aerial position in which to disperse your spores in a way that gets back to wherever your host is. So in the case of these non-cordyceps like fungi on the bottom here, but also but also fun fungi that do summit disease, um, these are all entomopteralian fungi, including entomophaga and entomoptera, and they want to get their spores elevated so that they can infect new grasshoppers in this case, or new flies that are flying around. It wouldn't do much good if this fly died and fruited down on the ground because there aren't a lot of flies hanging out down in the grass on the ground. But if it's way up on this blade of grass and then it turns upside down, so it's in this upside down position and then it's shooting all these spores off, it's gonna infect lots of flies that are flying by. And they're always upside down like this. If you wanna find these at your house, even in Colorado, um, go out to your clothesline. So those are fungal examples outside of cordyceps. In cordyceps, we, there are definitely a few examples known, including the famous um, unilateralis uh, species complex, and then also um, this stink bug, um, purpurio cilium um, lilacinum group, um, which is just super cool here. David Hughes and, and his lab, um, they've been looking into the behavioral modifications aspects of um, this summit disease. And one of the things that they did is they actually went in and looked at um, brain tissue. And what they found is that um, 
the brain tissue is um, is in green here, and then the fungal tissue is stained in red. And they found that no invasion of the brain tissue, like basically cordyceps isn't isn't growing into the brain tissue. And so that's not how the behavioral behavioral manipulation is um, taking place. But that didn't surprise me too much that it's not it's not growing into the brain tissue because you need to keep the host brain active, right, to be able to do this complex behavior of crawling up in the tree. So what's wrong with this picture? If I told you that you need to, you want to elevate your spore bearing uh, structure so that it's shooting spores onto where your hosts are. So what's wrong with this picture? It's upside down, just like all those spider pathogens are on the underside of the leaf. So you, so the ant has crawled up the side of the the uh, the plant on the stem, and then it goes on the underside of the leaf, and then that's where it bites into the midvein, and then the hyphae actually attach it to the underside of that leaf, and then it's oriented. So these are the spore, the pads of parathesia here to shoot down onto the ground where the ants are actually crawling around. So it's, it's not growing into the brain tissue. So how is it controlling the host behavior? And this is, you know, my, my thought is like, what's the fastest way to alter animal behavior? Drugs. Okay, good. So I kind of already alluded to this, but these cordyceps, they're making tons of secondary metabolites. We already know that some of them are insecticidal. We know that some of them have psychoaffective effects in animals. It's why the grass endophytes are anti-herbivory agents that are in this clade. Okay, so things related to claviceps. We also know that they suppress host immune fun function, and they can do this um, in large quantities in humans, as I'll talk about. So I just wanted to, to go through... Oh, I'll, okay, I'll just mention one last thing before going through some examples really quickly, but... So secondary metabolite genes in cordyceps are incredible. Basically, these secondary metabolite, they come in gene clusters within the genome. These are huge pieces of genomic real estate. These are some of the largest genes of all eukaryotes. And they are moving around the genome constantly. It's how we know, um, it, it's, it's the reason that you get these crazy numbers of unique genes at, for every single strain of cordyceps that you look at. It's the reason that you could look at one genus and have over a hundred different secondary metabolite process, uh, products. And so a paper that we came out with earlier this year showed that basically there's all this like chromosomal rearrangements that are leading to all these different secondary metabolites and they're being they're constantly moving around the genome and creating new combinations so genes are constantly popping in and out we're comparing two species here here there's these big giant secondary metabolites here it's been it's been cut out um, so anyway it's just just an aside that it's an absolutely fascinating area of study so I just wanted to give you a couple of examples of human relevant um, compounds produced by cordyceps the first of which is um, produced by um, one of these tulipocladium. And if you've ever had, uh, God forbid, a organ transplant, you have um, this fungus and um, this natural product um, drug produced by it to thank. And that's cyclosporin. Here's a picture of it. Another crazy giant, huge gene that um, makes this and then this giant um, cyclic peptide um, that in insects, again, this is an insect pathogenic fungus that makes this. In insects, this is suppressing their immune response so that the fungus can pr continue to proliferate and grow. Guess what? It does the same thing <laughs> to our immune response. And so it actually will just go in and turn off our immune response because it's going to go in and affect um, a regulator, so a regulatory gene that's going to turn off a whole suite of things in our cells that make us not respond to uh, invaders or foreign objects. So the cells aren't really harmed otherwise, but in the 80s, the discovery and um, production of cyclosporin basically enabled organ transplants to become a thing. Before that, it wasn't feasible on any kind of scale that it is now. It's also used in ophthalmic treatments nowadays, so like to make your eyes less red and when they're having some crazy hyperimmune response. But 
it is still used in one of the most widely used immunosuppressant drugs in the world. So this is that um, fungus I've been showing you lots of pictures of today, originally described from the soil. It's a saprobe. It grows really well in the soil. It produces canidia um, and on these cute little phyllides. In certain parts of the world, it, when encountering an insect beetle host in wood, it will do its sexual reproductive thing, but uh, most of the time just a, a soil fungus, and that was how it was identified first. The last um, compound that I want to talk about, are, or compounds, um, are produced uh, by, again, not by a cordyceps, because it's not an insect pathogen, but it's related to all these cordyceps, and guess what? It has some of these properties that affect animals because it is evolved from um, an insect pathogenic ancestor. And so this is Claviceps purpurea. It affects heads of rye and other grasses. You've probably heard it called ergot of rye. And it produces a whole ton of, just like all these, a ton of secondary metabolites. But the ones that it's most known for are the ergot alkaloids. And they have a couple of different side effects because these are different groups of compounds. So they actually have different effects if, if consumed because you're not getting a dose of a single drug, right? You're taking a cocktail. So the first of which is um, convulsive effects. So these, are, these include the like seizure spasms, the psychosis, and nausea. Now, other compounds, others of these are alkaloids, are cause what we call the vasoconstrictive effects. So these are going to be the, um, you know, the blood vessels getting smaller. And this is what can cause gangrene, as pictured here, edema, and low blood pressure. Um, and its a historical uh, uh, significance can't be understated. Its vasoconstrictive effects um, have been harnessed um, by modern medicine. Claviceps was traditionally used in postpartum bleeding. So this is a way to stop bleeding when you don't want it um, to occur. So St. Anthony's fire um, was actually a phenomenon as documented um, in this painting, you could see it was back in the Middle Ages in the 1500s, and any time they would have an outbreak, maybe it was a really rainy year, then you get the growth of this ergot fungus in whatever grain you're eating, and then you go out and you make your milled grains, and you mill up the the fungus. And maybe if it's a really rainy year, you get a lot of concentration of these air, air got, ground up ergot and therefore ergot alkaloids in your bread or whatever, you know, um, wheat you're consuming. And people used to get it and um, have these um, gangrenous areas um, and also the, the seizures and convulsions. And this became known as um, St. Anthony's fire. The reason it's called St. Anthony's fire. So the fire part is the edema and the gangrene. <laughs> you can't feel your extremities anymore. The St. Anthony's part is that there was a, um, a monastery and named St. Anthony's, and so people thought that it, they could get cured if they would go to St. Anthony's. Now, what are they actually doing if they're leaving their home and going far away to this monastery, St. Anthony's? They're leaving the place that has the claviceps behind, so um, that no wonder they were getting cured. But yes, so um, St. Anthony's fire back in the Middle Ages. Now, there is a hypothesis, and it's just that. I mean, there's some, like, on the historical side, not the mycological side. On the historical side, this is like, talk about make some people angry, you know. Um, but there is a hypothesis that the Salem witch trials could have resulted from a really rainy year that resulted in an outbreak of um, ergotism. And so these are some of the uh, historical accounts, temporary blindness, deafness, burning, burning sensations, visions like a ball of fire, uh, multitudes in white glittering robes. The theory goes that people looked back, uh, a scientist looked back at historical records and said, hey, it was really wet the year before. They were eating lots of rye and other grains that we know are susceptible to um, claviceps, and potentially this is the reason that we, um, that, that the Salem witch trials resulted in these. So it's, it's a theory. So the modern significance, um, as I mentioned, um, these vasoconstriction of properties, not only have they been used in postpartum um, bleeding, but also in um, migraine treatment again. So you're um, causing those blood vessels to constrict in the brain.
So if you take um, ergotamine and um, you actually transfer this moiety here, you remove it, then you make something called LSD. The chemist who developed this at Sandoz in Switzerland was um, Albert Hoffman, and I just love this quote that he gives um, about um, his first experience with one of these. Remarkable restlessness combined with a slight dizziness is not unpleasant, indicate uh, intoxicated like condition characterized by extremely stimulated, uh, stimulated imagination. When I closed my eyes, I found the daylight to be unpleasantly glaring. I perceived an uninterrupted stream of fantastic pictures, extraordinary shapes with intense kaleidoscopic play of colors. After some two hours, this condition faded away. So this is, you know, and it led to a whole uh, uh, change in uh, the counterculture and the generation back in the 60s. All um, stems from work on these insect pathogenic fungi and um, the secondary metabolites that they're uh, producing. So I, if anything, I just want to leave you with the fact that there's still so much that we don't know. Um, you know, if every cordyceps sensulato, so if every cordyceps like fungus is producing just five new compounds, which I think there's pretty good evidence to say that that's the case, um, then there are more than 2,500 compounds waiting to be discovered and that we just don't have the um, manpower um, to isolate. So. With that, I'd like to really thank my collaborators over the years uh, from the U.S. and from China and Korea. And if you ever find any cordyceps, in, especially in the Rockies, but anywhere, um, or um, tiny little cup fungi, um, our lab is working on those. So thank you. <laughs>